And of course, that one that's uh, just a closer walk with it, it's been our kind of theme hymn for the month as we've been working through this study. And we began 2024 with uh, a short study. We've been looking at every Sunday in January of how we can walk closer with the Lord. This is something that all of us should desire, and I hope that you do desire it, and I believe even it's what God wants from us as well, that we would walk with him. We've been thinking a little bit about what that means in, in the past few weeks. And I think I was reading this week that really something that the prophet Jeremiah wrote, which reminds us about really God's desire for us to walk with him. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So, God wants you to know him. God wants you to understand him. And if you want to know and understand someone, the only way to do that is to build a relationship with them, to spend time with them. And God wants us, uh, and really it's not possible for us to, to know him and understand him unless we spend time with him regularly. Time in his word, listening to his words, learning about his ways, time growing in our relationship with him. That's what it means to walk with the Lord. Our walk is about the way we live. It's about our relationship. It is a daily by day, as we've sung, and a moment by moment, again, a relationship and walk and, and trust that we have of God. And we've covered quite a bit in the last few weeks, and I don't want to go over a recap. I've done that the last few weeks. So I thought really what I wanted to do was just jump into something that would help us and uh, and I thought the best way to finish off our study, as we do uh, today, would be to look at an example from Scripture of somebody who walked with God and someone who perhaps we can learn from. You know, God tells us that the things that are written in his word, in both the Old and the New Testaments, they're written for our learning. And we're told that they're examples in Scripture and they're given to us for counsel. And so with many examples in scripture, as well as instructions, we've got examples of people who did walk with God. And there's quite a number of them. And as we're thinking about the different people that we could look at, I was really drawn back to be reminded that we should finish off our study by considering the very first person who was specifically told in the Bible walk with God. Because any time we see something in the Bible, the very first time it's mentioned is important to us. It, it actually really lays a foundation for us. And so we're going to look at this this morning. And so if you have a Bible or if you want to look on the screen, we're going to go back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis chapter 5. And we're going to examine uh, a man by the name of Enoch. Now, there are more than one Enoch in the Bible. In fact, as we'll see, there's even one in Genesis 4. But this one that we're talking about is the one that we're specifically told in the very first time these terms are used, that Enoch walked with God. We want to understand a little bit about what that means. There's only a few verses here in, in Genesis. And, and thankfully, God has filled it out with a couple more verses in the New Testament, or only a handful. Uh, two verses in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews and two verses in the letter of Jude. And when we combine all of these three readings, and again, not much, but when we look at them and we look at the context of them, there's some powerful lessons for us with regard to our walk with God and, and looking at Enoch's walk with God as well. So let's just jump into the scriptures and do that. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 5. We're picking up Genesis chapter 5, which is one of those what you call genealogies. It says this person gave birth to, or they use the term in the King James, begat so-and-so. And it talks about how long they lived and it goes on. And we're going to pick up just before Enoch and read Genesis 5, 18 through 24. And so let me read these, uh, these verses to you. And Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. 
And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 300 years. 60 and 5 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him he was not the Lord took him it's a very interesting statement well what does that mean well we really need to go to the New Testament letter of Hebrews to find out a little bit more about that and so Hebrews chapter 11 if you want to turn in your Bibles give you a moment to that Hebrews chapter 11 and verses Five and six give us a bit more detail. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and it was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now I'd like us to go to the final reading this morning, which is in the second last book of the Bible, which is the letter of Jude. Jude was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he writes this, gives us the final details which fill it out. And Enoch also, the seventh of Adam, prophesies of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they ungodly have committed and of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Well, that's quite a bit to take in. Let's, uh, let's take a, a moment to ask the Lord to help us to understand these three passages and as we take some time to look at the life of Enoch, what we can learn about what it means to walk with the Lord and Enoch's example. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much again for your word this morning. Thank you for our gathering together as your people. We thank you also for the study that we've been working through in, in learning about walking closer with you. That's our desire, Lord, that we would grow in our, our relationship with you, that we would follow you and obey you. And Lord, we know from that come great blessings. We read today about this man, Enoch, and we, was, we will see there was a great blessing for him in walking with you. And Lord, we live today in anticipation of a similar blessing, Lord, as uh, we await your return. And Lord, we ask you again, Speak to us today through your word. Encourage us, Lord, uh, and, and help us even to draw nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Genesis is known as the book of beginnings. We've been, as I mentioned in our Wednesday Bible studies, doing a bit of a study on that, looking at the beginnings, the origins of things. We began that last year, and in uh, February we'll be moving back into that. There's a bit of a plug there to say, come along. <laughs> Uh, learn a bit about the book of Genesis. And, the, and what we find, particularly in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, of this book, God lays down the beginnings of things, the origins of things. You know, where did, where did man come from? Where did the universe come from? How are we in such a mess that we are today with sin and wickedness and evil? Where did that all come from? God explains it in the book of Genesis. And we, as we read that, we, uh, God really gives us a lot of important foundation. And it's by reading the book of Genesis that we understand much of what we see in the world. Now, one of the things we also realized when we were, have been in our study of the book of Genesis was that these, the book of Genesis, particularly the first 11 chapters, are probably some of the most attacked um, parts of the Bible by the world who says, well, look, you really believe that God created everything? You really believe in a literal Adam and Eve? And as we read this morning, you believe that people lived 900 years, you know, <laughs> or that? Well, the Bible gives us the explanation for those things. And, uh, and I do believe that because God says it. Now, there's also many in the church and so-called scholars that ridicule these and say, look, this is not real events. These are just 
symbolic. They're just kind of myths and legends, as it were. But God's word's true. And God presents this as real events with real people. And if you're a New Testament Christian uh, and you believe what the New Testament writers wrote, you'll see that the New Testament writers believed what God said in Genesis. And they went back to that. And here, for instance, we have this man, Enoch. And Enoch was a real person. The New Testament affirms what was in the Old Testament. We notice there that the writer of Hebrews spoke of this man, Enoch, and told us further details. Jude refers to Enoch, and he refers to him even as the seventh from Adam. And so we know that this is, you know, that Adam is a real person. He talks about that, and really um, there's, there's reference to there as well. So the book of Genesis, and particularly those first 11 chapters, are so vital for us because they present the beginnings. And as we look at the beginnings, we're also presented with different people and different choices. This chart might be a little bit hard to see, and uh, we'll probably look at this more in our Bible study, but just so that we understand the way that the book of Genesis follows the descendants of Adam. All of us are descendants of Adam and Eve, the Bible says. Um, and we know Adam and Eve sinned, and because of that, all of us um, uh, have inherited that sin nature. But when we read the book of Genesis, we notice that in chapter 4 and chapter 5, there are two descendancies, two lines, two genealogies. You might remember that Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. That was initially, they were the first two born. Now, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Some of these people that mock the Bible say, well, where did Cain get his wife? Well, it was probably one, it was one of those other sons and daughters. And you say, you mean Cain married his sister? Yeah, they could do that in those days. There's genetic reasons that that was okay. There's moral reasons that that was okay. Um, and so that was the case. But we notice here that what God does is he doesn't follow all of those different sons and daughters. He specifically picks out two lines. We notice that Cain murdered his brother Abel. We read of that story. He was jealous of Abel. Abel brought a, an acceptable sacrifice to God. Cain just wanted to do things his own way. And as a result, Cain, marked by God, he was protected by God, but he, he continued that path away from God. And we notice here in this down here, what we is often is referred to as the unrighteous line, Cain and his descendants and their departure from God. Abel, of course, is with God, um, but then Seth, we're told, was born after him. And in fact, we're told in Genesis 4, 26, that Seth was born, and then when Seth's son Enos was born, we're told in Genesis 4, 26, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And so we have this line down through Seth, which ultimately goes to Noah, which ultimately goes to down to Abraham, which ultimately goes down to Jesus Christ in the, in the future. And this is what we call the righteous line. Not that everybody there was righteous, not that even everybody there followed God, but through this line. And God remember that in Genesis, God promised that there would be a seed, a seed of the woman that would crush the serpent and that would redeem mankind. And so it's through that line. Now, I want us particularly to pay attention here as we look at this, that I've highlighted this, these two different people, because in Jude, it says that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. He was the seventh from Adam, a seventh descendant down from Adam through the line of Seth. Now, there was another man here that was the seventh descendant, and his name was Lamech. And these, these really are two very different paths. You might notice in the first week we were talking about choosing two paths, the, the path of the ungodly or the way of the righteous. And these are demonstrated in these two different lines. Now, uh, we'll look at this in our study, but you'll notice there are some similar names. There is an Enoch on this side. There is a, um, a Lamech on that side as well. And I don't want to bring confusion into it, but we're specifically looking at these two people. And whereas the scriptures don't tell us a lot about uh, the others, we are given some details both about Enoch and about Lamech. They really are laid out in contrast to, to each other. In Genesis chapter 4, we read about Lamech, and Lamech was a murderer, and he boasted in his murder. En Enoch was one who walked humbly with God. 
the word take is used of both men. We find that Lamech took two wives to himself. Became, uh, you say, is the first polygamist, the first person to have multiple wives. He broke the pattern that was established in Adam and Eve, one man, one woman. And that would be later established by Christ and the church. Enoch, on the other hand, wasn't focused on what he could take, what he could get. He was focused on the Lord. He walked with God. And we read there that he was taken. We can find out a little bit more about what that means. He wasn't going through this life thinking about everything that he could gather for himself. And he was taken so that he, as we realise, escaped death. Lamech is a type of the world of that ungodly line. Enoch is a type of those who have faith and trust in God, the way of righteousness. And Enoch is also a type of you and I in church age believers who will, if we're still here when it takes place, will be taken by the Lord in what's known as the rapture. We'll escape death, we'll be transformed, or as is mentioned in Hebrews, translated. The name Enoch comes from a root uh, word which means dedication. And he certainly lived up to his name as someone who was dedicated to the Lord. We don't know a lot about Enoch. We don't know his wife's name. We don't know about what he did and all those sorts of things. But the one main emphasis that we're given about Enoch is he walked with God. That's, that's the main thrust, the main emphasis. He may not have been the first to walk with God, but he's the first specifically that is mentioned. Now, in previous weeks, we've learned about what it means to walk with God. Our walk refers to our conduct, to the way we live. It refers to this ongoing relationship. To walk with God means to listen to him, to obey him, to delight in his word. We've also learned that as we do that, we will bring forth fruit. And that fruit is produced by God himself through the Holy Spirit. And that fruit represents itself in such things as love and joy and peace. Paul tells us in his writings a number of things that we're commanded to do in our walk. We're to walk in the light. We're to walk in the spirit. We're to walk in love. Last week, we realized we need to walk wisely or walk in wisdom, redeeming the time. And if you're walking with God, these is, this is really characterizes the way you live. And so Enoch is set before us as an example of what it means to walk with God and how to keep these commands in concerning our walk. And so today we're going to have a, a look really at Enoch and I just want us to look at three points regarding Enoch's life. Firstly, we want to consider about his, his walk, the fact that Enoch did indeed walk with God. And in Genesis chapter 5, we're given those few verses. Genesis chapter 5, it tells us Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah and Enoch walked with God. That's the first time it mentions it. And it says after he begat Methuselah 300 years, begat sons and daughters, all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God. That's the second mention. And then it says, and he was not for God took him. If we were to take the time to read Genesis chapter 5, you'll read about, it talks about this person, they had sons and daughters, and then they died. This person had sons and daughters, and then they died. We read that about Jared, his father. It said that he had sons and daughters. He lived actually 800 and something years, and then he died. Right? You might wonder, how could people live that long? Well, the world pre-flood was very different from the world today. And I won't go into all the details of that. Suffice to say that not only was the genetic, uh, our, gene, our genetics were not as corrupted, but also the environment of the earth was such that people could live for such a long time. After the flood, lifespans were much shorter, cut down to 100 years and very shortly afterwards to 80 years, which is, is what we have today. The great theme of this chapter is that everyone who is born dies. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, God said to Adam, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that death means separation, separation firstly from God, but ultimately he said you'll return to the dust from which you came in Genesis chapter 3. Death in that case is the separation of our body from our spirit. You know, people have different thoughts about death as you think, as you look at them around. There's some that they kind of just really 
look at death as kind of like, hey, when you're gone, you're gone. They think you cease to exist. And so therefore they say, live life to the fullest. Do what you want. Enjoy life. Make the most of it. As, we've, as it says in the scriptures, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you die. It's all going to end. We're not going to be here. So just go through life doing whatever pleases you, whatever makes you happy. Let's not be constrained by other people's morals. Let's not have any restraints. Just live life to the fullest. Often you'll hear people that they talk about. They died doing what they loved. And that was the most important thing for them. You have others, of course, that uh, maybe say some, that somehow think that they can cheat death. And what I mean by that is they're trying to achieve immortality. They're trying to do whatever they can to fight against death, to say, you know, there's certainly we can overcome this. And it might be through their form of religion or it might even be, of course, physically or things like that. They're scared of death and rightfully so. And yet they do everything they can to try and defy it. But the Bible says... For by one man sin entered into the world and death, uh, and death by sin is through Adam and so death passed upon all men for all of sin. Sin brings death, all of us are sinners and as a result of that we all face death. Now, there's a third type of people that consider the fact, the reality that all of us are going to die one day, all of us are going to leave this life. And as a result, they know that also they believe that there's a purpose in our lives and that we have one that we will give account to. And when we die, we'll give account. And when they think about that, they think about the fact and it will, uh, again, turn them to the fact that there is a God, a God that we would give account to. And so they think about how they will live this life in such a way that when they give account to God, that they would be accepted. Now, we know the Bible says our works will not get us to God. But that focus, that seeking of God is something that others do. And this is what Enoch's doing when it says about walking with God. The fact is that he knows because he's seen it around in others. Yes, they lived long lives. They, he knows that he will one day die. That's inevitable before him. He knows because of Adam's sin. By the way, Adam's still alive when Ad, and then Enoch's still alive. So Adam can tell him firsthand about this. He knows that, and yet even though he knows that, he says, no, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to live for God. Now, after we know, not long after, there's a judgment that's coming upon the world. And as we'll see this morning, I believe Enoch knew something of what was coming. But he made a decision. I'm going to walk with God, and I'm not going to just live my life for myself. I'm going to make that a priority. Well, several things we, we can see about Enoch in his life and we notice about even from these few verses here. Enoch and his walk with God. Firstly, I believe that Enoch walked with the God who was unseen. There's no evidence in scripture to say that he ever was face to face with God. In fact, you know, we know that it says in the garden, when Adam was in the garden, that it talked about God walking in the cool of the day. And there was this idea that I believe probably the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the, the, uh, the son of God that he walked with. But we read nothing of that after. And so Enoch's walk with God was likely with one who he did not see. And therefore, it's a walk of faith. You know, it's easy to walk with another person. We walk and we spend time in relationship with them. We can see other people. We have fellowship with them. We talk with them. You can reach out to them. You can touch them. They can touch you. You can kind of converse. Uh, that's not so difficult. But, you know, it is. But to walk with a God who you cannot see requires faith. God here is unseen. We don't read about God physically and audibly speaking to different people at this time, in, in a, in, although that may have been the case. But really, a lot of time, I think it's just that Enoch doesn't, he doesn't see God. He knows of God, and yet he's walking here by faith. And that's difficult even for us today. You know, we can't see God. It says no man has seen God at any time. No one has seen him in all his fullness. And it's difficult for us because we can't see, but that's the whole point. God wants us to believe by faith. Our flesh, our, our senses are, are kind of against that. Our guilty soul is against it. You know, we're told that God's holy. 
We understand when we come into the presence of a holy God, we, it makes us realize, hey, I'm a sinner. And there's something that bucks against that. The world doesn't want us to believe in God. And yet the Bible makes it clear that, and when God makes it clear, he is, as we see, and he's a rewarder of those that seek him. And so what we notice that even against the flow of the world at this time, and we, we understand a bit more about the world that Enoch lived in, it was rapidly becoming and was a very wicked world. Enoch made a choice. I'm going to walk with the unseen God, the God that I cannot see. The second thing we notice is that he walked with God before his family. When we read the, the, the passage in Genesis chapter 5, it talks about these different people notice it said that Jarrett lived a certain amount of time and he begat sons and daughters and then after it says these people lived it talked about the fact that they lived but it didn't talk about the fact that they walked and there seems to be some sort of difference here it's not that they didn't have faith in God some of them did and we realize it says that men began to call on the name of the Lord but maybe they were so focused on just living their lives out I mean they had a long time they had a lot of children too Sons and daughters was more, not just two or three. Over time and over hundreds of years, you would have had many, many children. Those who lived probably were more focused on this life and the things that, that were of this life. But Enoch, it tells us that he walked with God. And it seems to set out something distinctly from him, from even his ancestors and those around, the ones before him. He walked with God, walking suggests purpose and he, it suggests the idea when you're walking with someone that you are actually wanting to follow them or be with them or you have some sort of concern about them trying to please that one you want to go in the same direction you can't be walking with someone with then going that way and you're going this way you're not walking with them you're coming alongside them you want to be going in the same direction and while others are you could say just merely living Enoch was walking he had a definite purpose in his life and that purpose was to be with God, to be alongside God, and God would direct him in his path. The other thing we notice in this that, it, that just stands out is it says that his walk is mentioned after his firstborn child comes into the earth. Verse 21 says that he lived 65 years and then begat Methuselah. So that was his firstborn child at 65 years. It's a little bit different from how we think today, you know, we, you wouldn't wait so long to have a child, but in that case it was. But we notice it says that after he begat Methuselah, it kind of puts a first point there. It says, this is the firstborn. And then after that, it says he walked with God. So like all of us, he began on a path that was the path of the unrighteous, you could say, the path that had maybe no regard for God. I believe that might have been the case, but something changed in his life. And it seems as though the birth of this son and uh, even the, the naming of his son, which we'll come to in a little bit, that was possibly the point where he made a decision. I'm going to, I want to know God. I want to walk with him. I don't want to just live out my life. I don't want to just live and have a big family. No, I want to I want to walk with God. And as he thought about that, it made a difference to him. You know, often it can be when you have a child uh, that you start to get, it kind of dawns on you the seriousness of it. I know when my first son, Matthew, was born, it kind of really shook my world a little bit. And I say that in the sense that, um, you know, I was going along with career and various things like that. And it really was some of the things that led me into starting my own business and probably into a closer walk with the Lord and ultimately ministry was the fact that, hey, now I have a son and I need to, and I have a responsibility for that child. And I have an example that I need to set for that child. And I want that child to know God. So I better, I better focus on my own walk with God. And maybe that was the case with Enoch and Methuselah. That might have been the case. But Enoch, of course, also had other children. And we notice that his walk is mentioned in the midst of others' births. He said he had sons and daughters. And if you think about even living 365 years, he probably had a lot of sons and daughters. And those sons and daughters grew up and they had sons and daughters. And it, it tells us that, you know, he had a family around him. Now, sometimes it's easier to walk with God around people you don't know or people that you're not so close to. 
But often when it comes to your family and your own home, that's where it really becomes a challenge. And he was a man who walked before God, but he, he walked with God, but he did that amongst the, those closest to him, his family. And perhaps even some of that family might have been kind of antagonistic to God. Um, this line of the righteous doesn't mean that all of them were righteous, that all of them were seeking after God. And maybe even in the midst of that, he's facing some family pressure. Hey, you know, you're following God. What about your family? You need to be spending more time with your family. You're not really giving that. I don't know what the case is with that. We're not told. But we do know because he had a family, he was also walking with God before that family. They were seeing his example as well. And walking with God is shown here also to be of great blessing. What was the blessing? Well, Enoch, we're told, walked with God. We're told that he walked with God 300 years. And then it's told that in verse 24, we're given this twofold, it may not seem like a blessing, but we'll see that it is in a moment. It says that he walked with God and was not. And it goes on to say that he went to be with the Lord or the Lord took him. He was not, this is not referring to death. He didn't die. He was just not on the earth anymore, but he didn't die. And this is actually obviously in complete opposite to all of the others who were born. They lived even a long amount and then they died. What happened to him? Well, we're told the Lord came and took him and took him what? Took him home to be with himself. He said, come on home. He was the first man to escape death after Adam's sin. Was Enoch a sinner? Yes, he was. Should he have died? Yes. Uh, why didn't he die? Well, God took him. He was the first man to escape a physical death here on this earth, and God took him home to be with him. There's one other man that we've mentioned in, in the Bible that that happened to. His name's Elijah. You might, have mentioned, you might remember him. And other than that, every man has gone through death. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, when he came, he died. But there's coming a day, Lord willing, and we live in anticipation of that day, of Christ's coming. And that Christ's coming will we begin with what he refers to as the rapture of the church. It's what Titus calls our blessed hope. In Titus 2.13, it says that we are to be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And if the Lord should come while we live, if that should happen and we live in anticipation of that, then just like Enoch, just like Elijah, we'll leave this life without dying. We'll go directly into the presence of the Lord. The Lord will take us to himself. It's described in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, puts it clearly here. It says, The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In other words, those who've already died in Christ, their bodies will be reunited with them. And then we which are alive and remain. And Paul thought that was going to happen in his lifetime. We live in anticipation of that uh, in our lifetime. Mm. Could it happen? Yes, at any time. We don't know. We live by faith. We trust God. But it says that we and we're alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You mean we'll be gone? Yeah. And he actually goes on to say comfort one another with these words. That is a comfort. That is a blessing. God takes us to be with him if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful blessing. And the, of course, we know the Bible has more to say about that. Walking with God brings a great blessing, and it did for Enoch, and it will for us as well. Now, one of the things we also notice is that for Enoch here is that there is no specific command to say, walk with me. He just did it. He just made that choice. I'm going to walk with God. Now, I say that because a little later on we get to, and you might have seen in that chart, it said that Noah walked with God, and then it goes down to Abraham walked with God. And in Genesis chapter 17, in verse 1, when Abraham was 90 years old, God really speaks to him. He speaks to him audibly and says, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Walk before me, walk with me. Come and walk in a manner that's pleasing to me. Come and walk with your God. He was commanded by God. He said, come and walk with me. And of course, Abraham did. 
But Enoch, as far as we know, wasn't given that express command. He just chose to do that. He understood, he learned something about who God was, what God had, uh, he realized who he was and he wanted to walk with God. So that's Enoch's walk. That's the first thing. The second thing I want us to just look at uh, this morning quickly is Enoch's testimony. And that takes us from that passage in Genesis chapter 5 through to these couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 11. What does God have to say about Enoch? And why did God take him to be with himself? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, we read these verses again, and particularly verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So that really explains to us what it meant that he took him. It fills it out further here. Really, the, the writer here is interpreting Genesis chapter 5 for us. He says, you know, what does it mean that God took him? He, he, he translated him. Now, tra tra the word translated, you know, we think about you taking from one language and you're moving it to another language. He's saying that's a physical translation. I'm taking you from here and I'm moving you to there. I'm moving you to be with me. It says that he was translated that he should not see death and was not found. Why? Because God had translated him. Why? For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so what we see here is someone walking with God and, and yes, he's a sinner, but he's trusting in God. He has faith in God. And because he's walking with God, God says, hey, I really want you to be with me. And I really want you to be with me always. Come on home. And he, he took him to be with him. His testimony was that he pleased God. Walking with God is something that pleases God. It's something that God desires. As we said, there's no command that was given to him to do that. He chose to do that. Enoch did walk with God and it pleased God. Enoch walked with a God that he could not see. And God says, hey, I want you to come and be with me. I want you to see me. And so he took him to be with him. God transferred him from this earth to heaven by changing his body and soul that it could now exist in heaven. That's, that's the translation. That's what needs to happen. You and I in our present state could not be in the presence of God but we will be translated as were, we'll receive a glorified body as Enoch would have, and he's in the presence of God. Now we said that Enoch was a sinner and he knew that he was a sinner because of Adam, uh, Adam's sin. And as I said, Adam was alive and no doubt, I'm sure would have conveyed this either directly to Enoch or through his children and grandchildren, the account of, hey, we, we sinned and that's why how death, death has come into the world. We also understand that, that God made a way of salvation, a way of redemption for those who have sinned. And back in, in the book of Genesis, we see that God made a sacrifice of some animals to give coverings to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness, but with their own uh, works. But God says, no, I will provide a sacrifice for you. We get to... Uh, Genesis chapter 4, we read about Abel bringing a sacrifice. And, and the fact that he pleased God, uh, I think, really reminds us and probably really indicates to us that there was, there was a blood atonement involved. Cain brought a sacrifice to God, but it was a sacrifice of grain and vegetables. It was a sacrifice of his own doing. It was not a sacrifice that God said was acceptable because you cannot come into the presence of God without the shedding of blood. We come into the presence of God today because of the shedding of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, his blood. But back then, there was a, 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 a sacrifice of an innocent animal was required as a placeholder and a pointer to what Jesus Christ would do. And though they didn't have the Bible, they didn't have all the details that we have, they were given some commands. And, and, well, and Abel knew that if he was going to come to God, he brought his sacrifice and it said that he pleased God. If Abel brought a sacrifice that pleased God, we know Enoch would have as well. In 1 John chapter 1, reminded that uh, these things about God, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it goes on in verse uh, uh, first john chapter 1 and verse 6 says that if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another us and god he's talking about here and the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin 
If Enoch pleased God in his walk, he must have known something about a necessary sacrifice. He wouldn't have been walking like Cain saying, hey, I'm just going to do things my own way. I'm going to bring my, what I think is acceptable. No, he wanted to know what would, why, how he could come into the presence of God. And I believe he understood that when you walk in the light, the light exposes your sin. And it makes you realize that and that sin must be dealt with. You know, Adam and Eve tried to have said those with their own coverings. But what we understand is the only covering that will cover sin is the shed blood of an innocent one pictured in the lambs, in the rams of the Old Testament, but ultimately in Jesus Christ. So Enoch pleased God because he trusted in the unseen God. He walked with God in the unseen, but he did that in a way that was acceptable to him. He came into the presence of God. Yes, Enoch was a sinner, but he was a sinner who was covered by the blood of the lamb, just as we today know that we have the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us and covers our, our sin. In Hebrews 11, we're given this explanation about Enoch being translated, and it says that he pleased God, but in verse 6, it goes on to explain to us something. And this is a very important uh, verse for us to remember. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. What pleases God? You can do all the works you want. You can try to do all these different works. He says, no, what God pleases God is faith. Trusting him, trusting him and trusting what he says, trusting his word. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. And we're given two things that he must believe. He must believe that God is, that God is true. He is living. He exists. Now, you think back then, well, Surely that would have been easier back then. Well, yeah, he, he had Adam there to tell him. You know, I said maybe he had never seen God, maybe he maybe never had any audible voice from God, but certainly had that testimony from Adam. And he believed that testimony. He believed that God was real. He believed in the unseen. He believed that God was real. And you and I need to believe in God that is unseen. We can't see him. The Bible says if we want to come to God, it begins by believing that he is, that he exists. The world today says there's no such thing as God or God's a good sort of thing to kind of lean on in your hard times. Is, you know, if, that, if, if that's what gets you through, some people say. Some people have a God of their own imagination. You know, this is why, again, we mentioned we have so many different religions. People make up their own gods. But the Bible is true and it talks about God and it says that if we, need, if we want to come to God, we must start by believing that he is. Do you believe that God is real? Do you believe that God exists? I believe that if you're here today, that that is probably the case. But he goes on also to say that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And what we find here is that Enoch, like we, uh, made a choice that, hey, I want to know this God. If this God is real, I want to know who he is. I want to know uh, what is what he's like. I want to know what pleases him. And in fact, if you think about it here, a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, if there's a reward involved, it actually tells us that there's someone that this God is evaluating. You know, you don't just get rewards for no reason. There's got to be a reason that you get a reward. And God is evaluating and, and he either punishes or rewards men according to their life. Now, we're not saying here that you earn your salvation. What pleases God is faith, and what God rewards is faith. And you and I trust in God, God rewards that faith, uh, and he does that by his grace. It's not deserved by us, and he does it by his mercy. And what God did for Enoch was because he had faith, because he walked with God and he pleased God by that faith, what God did is he removed death from Enoch. He said, Enoch, you won't need to, to go through death. And in a very real sense, he does that for us as well as believers. For you and I, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when we think about death, we have to understand what it says for the believer. Death is not pictured as separation from God. It's actually separation, yes, from our body, from this world, but we are ushered into the presence of God. You know, it talks in the New Testament when it talks about the death of the believer, it talks about sleep. It talks about sleep as the fact that just like you're going to sleep, you will wake up and for those that have 
have died in Christ, the moment they close their eyes in death, they awaken in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. That is not a, a bad thing for the believer. In fact, it's a good thing. And Enoch believed that God is. He's able to reward him. He's evaluating him. He looks at his faith and God has said, you know, because of that, he translated him, he brought to him. He believed that God existed. He believed that God would bless him. And he, because of that, uh, he must have believed in God's grace. He must have believed in God's mercy. And he knew of God's love as well. Well, finally this morning, I want us to go to that third passage, which is in Jude. And it really gives us an, uh, a bit more detail as to what Enoch believed. Because what we find here is that God revealed something to him. Enoch didn't have a Bible. The Bible wasn't written yet in Enoch's day. But Enoch, Enoch did have some revelation for God, whether that was directly by God speaking to him or whether it was through an, uh, another. But Enoch had a, a revelation from God. He knew something about God and he had a message. And I believe that Enoch proclaimed this message because when we read in Jude uh, 14 and 15, it says, And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. In other words, he spoke of this. He spoke of this to others. What did he speak of to others? What was Enoch's message? Well, it's an amazing message when you think about this is a, really the very beginning. This is the message that he had. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince the ungodly of all them, the ungodly deeds which the ungodly have committed and of all the hard speeches which the ungodly have spoken against him. He's speaking of the coming of the Lord with 10,000 of his saints. Now, this is amazing because this is before Jesus Christ came the first time. And this is really, as I said, right at the beginning of, of human history. But he's actually, God has given him a picture of what's going to happen at the end. And it hasn't even happened for us yet. But what we know from this, and we can determine firstly, he believed in the coming Messiah. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Jesus is coming back. Now, we're going to go to be with him in the rapture, but when he returns to this earth, he's coming with us. He's coming with all the 10,000, and that 10,000 is actually in the plural 10,000s. In other words, it just means a myriad. It means a, a huge number, a number that you cannot count. He's coming back with uh, his saints, his believers. He be also tells us that he believed in the glorification of the believer. In other words, when you and I as believers die, that we will be resurrected, we'll be glorified, we're with the Lord, and we're going to come back with him. We don't just go into the ground and that's it. No, we go to be with the Lord, and Jesus is coming back, and we're going to come back with him. And he also believes here, as we see in the judgment of the wicked. You know, he believed a great deal the lord gave him a revelation like he's given to you and me now you and i have much more we have the entire bible we actually have the whole picture of this and when it comes to enoch what we find is that he he had this message and he proclaimed this message and he walked against the world and this is often where it's a stumbling block for us because you know we as we've mentioned we want to be liked we want to be accepted none of us like to be frowned upon or spoken against, and yet, just as Enoch walked with God, we are to walk with God. And the world, we know at this time, was fighting against God. And we know that because shortly afterwards, and I say shortly afterwards, in the generation following it, after his son, God judged the world for its wickedness. He flooded and destroyed the world, saving Noah and, and his sons and family. The world was a wicked world in the days that Enoch lived. And God's patience ran out and God came and he was going to judge that world. Now, it's an interesting thing that we noticed that Enoch named his son Methuselah. And I think in this, he knew something of that judgment that was coming. The name Methuselah means, and Methuselah, by the way, was the oldest man in the Bible. He lived 900 and... 69 years, 969 years, the longest living in the Bible. But his name means his death shall bring forth or his death shall send forth. Now, it's a fascinating thing we can look at in all the names of the, of the, the people in, in the line of Seth. 
But the idea here is his death shall bring forth what? Shall bring forth judgment. So as long as Methuselah was alive, uh, the, the son of Enoch, um, you know, God he was extending grace to this world. But judgment was coming. And he was reminding him of this. And, you know, this is something that Enoch realized, I believed. And yet he's walking with God in this. And he's proclaiming this message that the, the Lord is coming. He's going to judge. Now, this message is not about uh, that he's proclaiming here. We understand it's not about Noah's flood. Yes, God, God did come and judge the world in Noah's flood. But this is looking way, way beyond that. And I say that because he's talking about the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. There weren't 10,000 of saints at that time even that had died that would be with the Lord. This is talking about a time in the future and this is the same time that was, was given to Daniel, given to other prophets in the Old Testament that they look forward to not Christ's first coming to this earth where he came to give his life as a ransom for us that came to save us but when jesus comes back a second time and that's something that we're living very much in the light of right now and the world today is poised for the return of jesus christ we're told that when he comes he will come with those who were redeemed and he will come to judge the wicked on the earth notice in as I read that, it said to execute judgment on all and to convince the ungodly among all of them of their ungodly deeds that they're ungodly have committed and the ungodly sinners and the ungodly. Notice the word ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. When Jesus comes back, it's not to judge us. We're, our, our penalty for sin has been paid in Jesus Christ. It's not because of us. It's because what Christ has done. When he comes back, he's going to judge this wicked world. And if, for those who are not in Christ, they will face that judgment. This is the message that Enoch had. And you think about that amazing all the way back then, that he was proclaiming something that even today we look forward to. And that only could be revealed to him by God. And as that was revealed to him by God, through whatever means, we're not told, he believed it. He believed the word of God. He believed what God said. And you and I have been given much more revelation from the word of God. We've been given an entire last book of the Bible, which tells us how everything is going to conclude. And just as Enoch believed the little that he had, we need to believe what God says about this as well. Those who would be judged were talked about ungodly. And those who died, uh, who, many who have died, uh, many of the saints who have died have been put to death by the ungodly, either by false accusations, the speech of the ungodly, or they've been killed by the ungodly by their doing. And here come the saints with the Lord. They're glorified. They're in glory. They're coming with Jesus Christ. And that is what we know will happen as well. Enoch gives, as far as we know, the first prophecy in the Bible of the Lord's second coming. And God removed Enoch from this earth and he took him to glory. I believe that's a picture of us as well, that before the judgment, we're going to be taken from this world. People say, oh, well, that's just escapism. No, God has promised it to us. Enoch walked with God, and for you and I, we need to walk with God too. The reminder for us is that just as Enoch walked with God, we should walk with God as well. You might say today, well, hey, no one else around me that I know, my friends, my family, they really don't care about God. Well, that was probably, may have been the case with Enoch as well. Enoch chose, you can choose as well. In our study, we've been thinking about this, choosing to walk with God, choosing to make God a priority. I pray that you will be like Enoch, not affected by the world around us, that indeed we will be trusting God in the days ahead. And I pray that this study, as we've been thinking about him, reminds us that we, we can trust in the Lord. We need to lean on his understanding in all our ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct our paths. And as we walk with the Lord, we can know the blessing in this life of love, joy and peace. And we know the blessing of going to be with the Lord. What if we're not taken in the rapture? Well, even in death, we're going to be with, with the Lord as well. And we know that that's a wonderful thing. Walking with God and walking in the light of the Lord's return, walking 
in such a way that pleases him is a walk by faith. I pray that you would all know the Lord and that you would trust him each day by faith as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you for this study as we've been considering this matter of walking with you. And we thank you for the example of Enoch's life. Even in these few verses, we see there's so much that we have learned. We've learned about his, his choices, his decision to to plead, to want to please you, to walk with you. Lord, help us too to make similar choices, to really, to um, even against maybe those around us who have no regard for God, that we would, we would want to know you, we want to please you, we want to walk with you. We know that what pleases you is faith, is trusting you. It's not our works. Uh, Lord, although you've called us to do good works, it's not our works that save us. It's not our works ultimately that please you. It's our trusting of you. And so, Lord, we pray that we would trust you each day. When we get up in the morning, we go through our day, when we lay it on our heads at night, Lord, we pray that you would be on our minds and that we would desire to walk with you. We look forward to the day when we will be with you, when we will escape this world Lord, there's things we enjoy in this world and that's fine, but Lord, we know that it will be far greater to be with you and we look forward to that day in Jesus' name. Amen.